Welcome to the webinar today, everyone. Uh, we'll be talking smarter engineering with bronze and selecting the best alloy. My name is Nicole Sterling and I'll be your facilitator today. We are recording today's session, so just keep an eye on your inbox for the recording. We'll send it out in the next couple of days once we've had a chance to do a quick quality assurance on it. Um, and then the last thing, we are taking questions today. So I know a few of you have now found that chat box. Um, that's where you'll be needing to post your questions to and we'll ask those of our speakers towards the end of the session. Our speakers today. So I'll do a little bit of an introduction. Um, now we've got Gary Gibb. Um, Gary started working at AW Fraser's in September of 1975 and he's worked for the company ever since. Uh, he worked his way up from being a lab technician and operator to a health and safety manager and to quality environmental and compliance manager. And during the last 45 years, Gary has built up an incredible knowledge of brass and bronze. And I wouldn't hesitate to say that Gary, what Gary doesn't know doesn't need to be known. Uh, and then our second speaker for today is Derek Sands. He's the material selection specialist and has been working in the Milson Group now for over 21 years. He's a third generation engineer and he's been selling bronze for that entire period of time. And on that note, we'll cover off a little bit of the agenda. So we are talking about bronze, surprise, surprise. Um, so we'll be going into what is bronze, uh, the bronze alloy naming systems and standards, the common alloys properties and applications, and then we'll be talking about selecting suitable new or replacement materials. And then as I said, we'll be going into an interactive Q&A session at the very end. On that note, I'm gonna hand it over to our very first speaker, Gary, to kick off the session. Good morning, everybody. Uh, my name's Gary Gibb, as you've had the introduction of been involved at AW Fraser with bronze for the last sort of 45 years. Um, and I guess a logical place to start was what is bronze? The bronze traditionally was a, an alloy of copper and tin, and it was developed before the, uh, the steel and the iron age. The reason for that was it's a much lower melting point. It melts at about between 1100 and 1300 degrees centigrade, um, which is lower than iron, so it was easier for the, the ancient people to, to deal with. We, uh, bronze is actually a, a name for what we refer to as copper alloys. It's just one of the copper alloys that we make, a multitude of them, and we, during the course of this uh, webinar, we'll go through some of the common sort of uh, grades. Before we get started on that, I'd like to um, just go through the uh, alloys. Uh, I'll go through the manufacturing system, sorry about that, manufacturing system very briefly of how it's manufactured. Now this is not all the ways that it's manufactured, this is what we do at A.W. Fraser in Christchurch. We, we do continuous casting, which is the one on the left, which is a, um, has a distinctive striped appearance to it. If you notice a bar, it has sort of stripes along the length of the bar. They're just surface marks, um, no bearing on the material, just from the cooling and the oxide layers on the outside. This process can do both hollow tubes and solid uh, rods. And the, the plant we have in New Zealand, the Christchurch, is capable of doing up to um, 200 millimetre in diameter. Uh, but very shortly, in fact, probably this week, there'll be some new plant commissioned that will do up to 300 millimetres. And the tubes can be made with, with wall thicknesses down to about six millimetre when you're down in the sort of the 25 to 40 millimetre uh, diameter. Once the diameter gets bigger, the, the wall thickness has to increase. Um, and at the 200 millimetre size, you'd be looking at around about um, sort of 20, 25 millimetre wall thickness. This, this process shown on the left is vertical. We could also do it horizontal. There's no significant differences between them. The second one is centrifugal cast. Once again, there's a holding furnace where we melt the metal at around about 1200 degrees Celsius. And the metal is poured through, a, through a, a pilot ladle into a rotating steel die. The die is rotating at around about 600 RPM, give or take 100 other side, depending on the diameter. And it spins until it, it freezes and there's cooling water goes on the outside of the steel die. So that's capable of doing sizes from 200 millimetres to up to 500 millimetres. But the one thing there, you can't do solids on that process, so it's got to be hollows. Normally they're done at a rough cask and then machined to the appropriate wall thickness inside outside diameter required. And the third one there is, is an extruded process. That's where a, um, a billet or a portion of solid or a 
this wall hole in it bar is heated to 700 degrees and then the pressure of the ram which in the case of the one in Christchurch is a thousand tons pushes the forces of metal through a heated I mean, a die and uh, the resulting solid or tube can be produced. Um, if it's a tube there's a mandrel that goes in with the die. And the tube. This process is not used from not capable of doing most of your bronzes uh, but there are some manganese bronze that come, can be done by this process but it's primary for brass but it's really just there for, for information. So they're the, the main process. There's of course of sand casting that um, is used a lot uh, but we have very limited amount of that in Christchurch but the main ones are the continuous cast, centrifugal cast and very minor one extruded. Before we um, move on to the, the actual alloys, I'd like to explain something about the, uh, the system for, for naming alloys. Um, possibly a lot of you are familiar with LG2, which certainly in New Zealand and Australia is the sort of the mainstay of, of your basic bronze. Most of your workshops have probably got a length of it sitting under a bench or a piece of LG2 that they sort of drag out if there's a, a general purpose job that needs to be done. So that was the British Standard 1400, which was developed in the 1960s and went through till about 1975. Um, it was then declared obsolete, but the name is LG2, and you'll see AB2, PB2, still remain, even though that standard's long obsolete. Um, every country had their own system for naming sta for standards. Um, British had theirs, Australians had theirs, the Japanese, the US had SAE and the ASDM standards, there's French standards, there's Italian standards, there's, there's a multitude of them. So in mid-1970s, the uh, Americans decided to develop a, a unified numbering system or a CDA system, the Copper Development Association, that would put every alloy on the same sort of system. And that was a system where you had a five-figure number and a letter in front of it. In the case of copper alloys, the letter was C. If it was aluminium, it was an A, and, and so it goes on. So the system was you have the C, and then you have the 83600, which is uh, LG2 in, in the British standard, uh, or SAE40 in the US standard. So the thing was the alloys above 800, uh, so 800 and 900 were cast alloys, and the numbers below 800 from yes, 100 through to 700. 90 were what we call wrought alloys or, or alloys that were cast and then had some sort of external force to to shape them or change their properties. So that was quite good in that respect. You can immediately see um, what the alloy was, or whether it was wrought or cast from the number it started with. So generally, and for the purposes of this uh, webinar, we'll just use the three numbers. So we we'll, we'll generally drop the C and we drop the final two zeros. The Final two zeros do help if it's uh, the case of um, say 95420, uh, the 20 tells you it's a slightly modified from the original alloy. So the system is quite useful in that and this was going to be great and it was going to simplify the whole alloy system. Unfortunately that has never happened to this day. There's still People still use LG2, you might have slash C83600. So whilst it's a good system, it never took off and um, we're still stuck with some of these old alloy systems. Also sitting beside these are the European standards, which I call sort of descriptive standards. And the one there at the bottom example of um, ISO 1338, this is your LG2 again, or your C836, it's known over there as CUPB5, SN5, ZN5. So immediately, you can tell what it's made up of, whereas the other ones tell you not much at all, like the LG2, 836. But this helps to tell you what the material's made up of, and that's what it is. It's 5% tin, 5% lead, 5% zinc. That's, and it balances copper, that's LG2, typically. So the European system has its advantages, but it does get quite lengthy when you've got some complex alloys and they have to drop bits off and things like that. And um, it was never popular uh, in the 70s and 80s when your computers would only take eight alphanumerics, so you had to end up abbreviating it. So they're the 
the systems around the Japanese have their system and uh, say so there's there's a multitude of them and and generally uh Cormax and, and myself and the guys at AW Fraser we have a lot of old information we can we can research uh, as well as the internet not everything's on the internet as far as allies go so usually a call to them we can generally unravel most things um, Derek is very good at that sometimes you get stumped and then we have to use other systems which we'll cover later on so that's just a, an overview of the allies system so I'll now go through the uh, the individual sort of groups and um, first one we're going to look at is gum metal and um, it was called gum metal because the cannon in the first view there was was made out of this type of alloy it's it's a uh, it's basically a 85 percent copper five tin five lead five zinc it's a sort of a medium duty sort of material it has uh, sort of lower tensile strength around 300 average yield strength and the hardness is, is 75 Brunel and, and good elongation so it's a general purpose material for things that are not under too much stress but um, I'd like to add here um, all of these alloys that we're talking about today do require lubrication they're not self-lubricating alloys um, some will require more lubrication than others some will be okay with just a grease nipple and uh, Grease groove, others require full film lubrication, you know, hydrostatic lubrication where the, the oil is pumped into the bearing. So LG2, average strength, and on the other side of that, I've got another common one, which is G1, which was uh, actually a gum metal. Um, and that's got slightly higher tensile strength and yield strength. Um, and once again, the hardness, generally all of these these four things are interconnected, like your tensile strength is, is the force that it'll break at. The yield strength is the point that if you go up to the yield strength and then took the, the um, force off again, the material will return to its original state or its original length, would stretch and then go back again. That's quite useful for engineering purposes. The hardness is really um, to, to do with um, a lot of cases with a bearing in the shaft and the elongation is the amount of stretch. So generally as the tensile strength and the yield strength go up, the elongation goes down, the hardness goes up. So the gum metals are commonly used and, and one of the lower cost materials in the bronzes. The next one you cover is the phosphor bronzes and um, they are generally high tin. So they're um, around about 12% uh, tin, 10 to 12% tin and the balanced copper with a bit of phosphorus generally around one, half a percent. They're called phosphor bronzes, they're also called gear bronzes. Um, now, some years back, the LG2 or the gum metal was also called phosphor bronze. That's not technically correct, but at the time it was, it was called phosphor bronze and that still hangs around a wee bit today, you see it. So the PB1 near the PB2, somewhat similar about two percent tin between the different between the two of them as you can see the excuse me the strength has, has gone up a bit um, and the hardness so they're better wearing they'll last a bit longer but there's a, a drawback here they're quite a bit more expensive and the reason for that is the tin's gone from five percent to ten or twelve percent and tin generally sits around about the 25 to 30 dollar a kilogram price so that's what makes the cost up. Also, there's more copper. There's no of the none of the lower cost um, additives like zinc or lead in them. Once again, they require lubrication, but they're much better wearing and popular for gears and and bushes that have a bit of impact, things like that. So harder wearing stuff. Next one we come to are the aluminium bronzes, or if you're in the USA, they're called aluminium bronzes. So they are somewhat newer alloys compared to the others that I think a lot of them were developed during World War II. The real common one, and I'd call it the LG2 of aluminium bronzes is, is C954, or we call it 954. This is, once again, you can see the strength's gone up. The yield strength's gone up, and our hardness has gone up quite a bit. Now, in this case, the hardness is important because with um, a mild steel shaft or sort of similar, you're pretty much limited to about 150 Brunel. So what's tell, that's telling us is with 180 Brunel, you've got to move away from a, a mild steel shaft. 
if you ran replaced an LG2 bush with, with aluminum bronze or 954 and, and left the um, mild steel shaft, then you're going to find that the shaft is probably going to wear instead of the bush. Now the idea is the bush should wear because it's certainly less expensive to replace it than a shaft that may be connected to a gear or something more complex. So also the aluminum bronzes require a much higher level of, of lubrication if they're going to be rotating rather than just sort of going back and forth motion. So that's an important consideration. So it's not just a matter of getting it to last longer. By going to a harder alloy, you've got to look at the other properties needed too. One interesting for the aluminium bronze is the use we've had in the past is, is a decorative finishes for um, aluminium bronze. And if, if you're familiar with the uh, Supreme Court building in Wellington, the facade on that is a, a series of uh, bronze extrusions about about 70 or 80 ton of it actually that was produced by the A.W. Fraser plant and, and then put together by A.N.G. Price. Um, it's, I believe it's supposed to simulate uh, Pahuta Kaua bark and they like the striped appearance of the continuous cast and, and this is all around the Supreme Court building. The next time you're in Wellington to check it out. Now one thing about uh, aluminium bronzes, well not all aluminium bronzes but certainly ones like 954 is they can be heat treated as you can see from the graphs there, that the heat treatment improves the, um, the properties considerably. The tensile strength goes up, the yield strength goes up hugely, and the hardness increases quite significantly. That's uh, becoming more popular with the aluminium bronzes, um, but there are sort of limitations on, on, on the manufacturing process for that, and the, um, the hardness, you've got to be very careful, which is... Uh, loss of elongation they tend to be a bit brittle if they um as a, as a trade-off so you've got to look at the application quite carefully and associated with the aluminium bronze it's still an aluminium bronze uh, but we call it a nickel aluminium bronze now the previous aluminium bronze 954 i should have said is typically just uh, about 85 uh, percent copper 10 percent aluminium five percent iron with the nickel aluminium bronze, you add another 5% nickel to the, to the mix. That um, makes it slightly tougher material, um, but the thing it does do is improve the corrosion resistance. The, the 954 type material is not the best corrosion, but it has good corrosion resistance, but it's a bit susceptible in, in harsh environments like um, seawater and things like that. So the, the Nickel aluminium bronze C95800 or AV2 as it's commonly known is, is very good for marine use and in fact it's, it's approved by Lloyds uh, for use on ships in certain areas but it does require an annealing heat treatment to just enhance the properties. It has the same properties as the other aluminium bronzes, uh, good, good wearing characteristics uh, but once again needs uh, very good lubrication uh, if it's in a bearing situation if it's on a ship just as a fitting or something then that's not relevant so that's something now the other one near the c95500 or 955 is a, is a super high strength uh, aluminium bronze and um, that's that's gets its strength from uh, heat treatment as well it can be heat treated the ab2 can't actually be heat treated but the 955 can so once again, high hardness, you need good hardened steel shafts, um, typically 350 Brunel or higher and, um, and very good lubrication. So then we have a, a category of leaded bronzes. Um, these are super high leaded. So they, they go from, they have tin as well. So they have about seven to 10% tin, but they also have um, a, a lead from sort of 8% up to 25%. Because of that high lead content, they're beginning to, beginning to fall out of favour with the, the environmentalists. Um, lead is a toxin in the environment, so they're trying to move away from these sort of alloys. In fact, the, um, the European standards for uh, alloys now is 0.1% lead maximum, so these are a fair way out of it at 25%. Um, but they're good for heavy duty, larger type bushes, typically, and crushes or you know, shingle crushes or mining industry 
The bearing material is, is relatively soft at 80 Grinnell and it also has the ability to absorb uh, particles of you know, whatever, maybe around the crusher dust or the mining dust or whatever into the bearing material so you don't end up damaging the shaft. It also allows the, um, the bearing to align to the shaft if it's, a, if it's a replacement one and you're putting a replacement bearing in on a bit of a shaft that's not quite true then they'll align to it, they're sort of a semi-plastic sort of bronze. They'll also tolerate short periods without lubrication, but we generally recommend that they do have lubrication. And any, any bush or bearing or anything in a wear application, if you've got lubrication, you're going to minimise the contact between the two services, so you get much better life out of it. So they're, they're a sort of a fairly small group, and the common one there is LB2. Uh, which is C937, that's the LB2, the British standard designation. And the final one uh, is the manganese bronzes. They're also known as high tensile brasses. They're actually a brass, but they're called a bronze. So that's just one of the peculiarities of the naming and system of, of copper alloys. The um, common one on that is, is C86300 or HTB3. You can see from those graphs very, very high strength, more higher strength than, um, than mild steel or some reasonable steels at 800 megapascals. Very good yield strength, high hardness and still good elongation at 16%. That's used a lot in the um, heavy machinery um, areas, um, you know, mining, um, you know, yeah, construction equipment, that sort of thing, cranes. So that, that's very usually widely used in that. Um, the one beside is 865, which is HTV1. Once again, these HTV1 and HTV3 are old British standard 1400 designations. HTV1 is just a lower, lower strength material. Um, used similar applications to the 863, but just a bit lower cost and not so hard. So not so um, you'd be able to use a mild steel shaft and things like that. Both of these alloys being, it says manganese bronze, but being a brass, can be susceptible to certain uh, corrosion conditions, not like the AB2, which is uh, resistant to seawater. These would generally not be used in seawater or continuous exposure in seawater. Right, so now we move on to you know, what, what do we do if we've got a typical example is someone's um, got a failed bush in a machine or something like that, and it's worn out, so we, we need to get another one. Um, we, the machine's so old, we can't get the original equipment anymore. So the first thing that people ring us, we say, well, have you got an engineering drawing? Typically on the engineering drawing is a, a little box uh, will have the material in it. Usually that's um, obvious what it is. It might say BS1400 AB2. In the case of it's a wee bit more obscure than generally Derek or myself or the guys at Henry Fraser or Cormax can work through that and, and find something that makes sense out of it. Um, a few of us, a few of them stump us, but uh, generally that's it's a good way to start. If that's not possible, then there's, you um, can analyze it with a portable XRF machine that uh, analyzes the chemical composition. And that's uh, the little machine on the right there. That zaps it with X-rays for about uh, anything from 10 to 25 seconds and gives you a breakdown of the chemical composition of the of the bush. Um, now that those guns will do copper alloys, they'll do aluminium, they'll do steels, um, they'll do a multiple multitude of different alloys. So once you've done that, you can often fit it back to a um, to a standard or something like that. Um, the other the other method is to cut a piece out of the of the bearing or whatever you've got failed there and send it to a lab for analysis, either by um, spectrometer or a wet lab analysis. They just should add these XRF guns, we have one at Christchurch, our plant there. Um, they're also, most of your scrap metal dealers would have one. So if you have a friendly scrap metal dealer, you can pop around there and ask if they can come around and zap your bush rather than have to take everything out and cut pieces out of it, you can save quite a bit of time. If it's a a new application or something you're not sure of, the first thing I like to ask people is, is you know, are you going to be able to lubricate it if you're replacing it? Maybe it's an oil impregnated bush, 
then you can't replace it with a plain bearing. You've got to have some sort of lubrication, as I say, the lubrication be from grease nipple or a full film lubrication with multiple pinnerate grooves inside it to, to make sure the oil is dist distributed around it. The other thing we look at is the maximum operating temperature. Typically your, your bronzes that we've discussed today, the, the tin bronzes, the gun metals and that, up to about sort of 220, 230 degrees Celsius. The aluminium bronzes, 260 to 300 degrees. Now they'll go much higher than that because the melting point's not until over a thousand degrees, but they do start to lose their strength when the temperature goes up. Um, so it is important that you, you work out the operating temperature. Going the other way, below zero, these alloys can go down to minus 150 degrees or more without any detrimental effect to the uh, mechanical properties, unlike steels, which can suffer some brittleness at low temperatures. So there's no, no issue with, with them operating at, at those sort of low temperatures. The other thing you've got to look at is the surface speed of the thing, for a, certainly for a bush or, or a wear surface. The higher the surface speed, the obviously the better lubrication you need, but um, some alloys high speeds and if you don't have enough lubrication the aluminium bronze will suffer a thing called galling where the metal transfers from the bush to the shaft and that causes shaft failure or bearing failure. The loading of the whole shaft and everything is important that's what we talked about the strength of the materials that's where your tensile strength and the yield strength come into it so that's important to work out and, and the shaft hardness is important so as I said up to around about 150 Grinnell for the, the bush you're okay with a mild steel shaft. After that, you've got to move to a um, hardened steel shaft, case hardened or whatever. As far as the design of the bearings and that, um, Cormac can assist with that. Um, and I believe they've sort of got things in, underway with that sort of area for bearing design. So um, there's always advice. We can work through things in a lot of cases. Um, just get, as long as we get the information. So that's uh, pretty much it from me. So uh, thank you, everybody, and I'll we'll see what sort of questions we have. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Gary, for that. Um, so let me just invite Derek to join us at the minute. So, Derek, if you want to jump online. Perfect. We've had a few questions coming in. Um, as I said, if you've got a question, just pop it into the chat or the questions section, and we will get to it um, during the next 20 or so minutes that we've got. Um, now, I do have one that's come in here, Derek, and I thought we might start with you on this one. Um, do the physical properties differ a lot depending on if the bronze is extruded, continuous cast, or centrifugal cast? And that one's come from Gavin. Okay, thanks, Nicole. That is a great question. Um, they do vary. The, the base normal way in history for producing um, a copper alloy casting would have been by sand casting or an open method of some sort um, that produces um, product of a lowish strength and um, integrity. The continuous and centrifugal casting methods are much superior to that for their purity, for their grain structure and for the mechanical properties, whether it be hardness, tensile strength and so on. And they're quite similar to each other in as far as the, the quality of the product that's put out. And then extrusion would tend to um, develop mechanical properties beyond the continuous and centrifugal casting options and a bit out on its own. But again, there's a limitation for what alloys you can actually extrude. Does that make sense, Gary? Is that about how you'd see it? Yeah, well, that's, that's right. I to say the, the chemical composition can be identical for all of them, but you do get superior product from the uh, centrifugal continuous car, especially freedom of porosity is a, is a big one, um, and inclusions are certainly very low in, in continuous casting and in, in centrifugal casting because it's all forced out for as time to come out of the, uh, the liquid alloy once it's um, been cast. So yeah, um, certainly the vertical, vertical casting process on this Continuous casting has very low porosity rates um, and strength wise you, you get a, a smaller grain size so you get better strength. Um, so yeah, continuous cast and um, centrifugal cast are superior to sand cast 
um, an extrusion, Stan decided it was it's better again, but a far more complex process and you can't do it with a lot of alloys. So a bit limited there. Great. Um, so hopefully that helped you out there, Gavin. Um, now I do have a question here from Cedric, um, which I will let you answer, but I will also just add to the piece. So Cedric's asked which alloy needed the lube, but what I wanted to just add first, um, Cedric, is that we do have a webinar coming up that's going to be specifically focused on lubrication. So keep an eye on the inbox for the invitation to that one. However, um, Gary, did you want to answer the question in the meantime of which alloy needed the lubrication? Sorry, what was that question? The alloys need lubrication? Yes, that's correct. Yeah. So all of the, as I say, good lubrication will make it last longer. Um, bad lubrication, it won't last long. So we, we recommend that all of the alloys we talked about today have lubrication. Um, it's far more important than the aluminium bronzes and, and the heat treated alloys and the manganese bronzes than it is in the others, but it's, it's necessary for all of them. As I said, some can get away with a grease nipple and greasing occasionally and have a grease girdle, and that would be typical of a thing that's just going backwards and forwards like a pivot on a, on a tractor or something like that. Um, but if it's rotating at 1000 RPM or something like that, it needs a proper full film, we call it, so whereas the lubrication, the oil covers the whole surface of the of the bush and that normally requires some sort of oil grooving or something to be in there. None of these bushes will run without, will go without lubrication, but they won't go for long. So the general rule is, you know, the better your lubrication, the better the life you'll get out of the, out of the bush or the, or the bearing or the whatever it is you're, you're making. Great. Did you want to add to anything to that one, Derek? No, no, that was a great answer. It covers it nicely. Perfect. Um, all right, so I've got another one here then from David. He's wanting to know if I am currently using C954 and I want to upgrade to C954 heat treated, should my bronze be heat treated before machining or after? <laughs> so, um, yeah, most certainly you should um, heat treat before you machine it. Um, the main reason there is that the heat treatment process, correct me if I'm wrong, Gary, but it's heated to quite a high temperature and then cooled in water. So that um, creates quite a bit of distortion with the metal. So any part that you um, machined and then did that to, it would be significantly out of shape. You need to start with the raw material heat treater and allowing quite a bit with machining to come off afterwards to get it into the right shape that you're looking for. Yeah, just like to add to that, uh, some people uh, partially machine it to get rid of a lot of excess metal and then, especially if say of a flange push or something like that, then heat treat it and then finish machine it. The, the less you can heat treat, it's a lot easier. And also there's, there's limitations on the length you can heat treat as well um, because of the distortion as direct thing. Um, it's quite a severe it's, it's happening to the uh, to the bush, but it goes from you know high temperature into water. It, uh, they definitely go out of shape. So yeah, so there is that other option of what we call sort of proof machining or semi finished machining, and then heat treating it and then finished machining. Great, thank you. I hope that helped answer that particular question. Um, I've got one here from Thomas wanting to know how do the different alloys stand up to steam and or water environments. Um, Derek, did you want to start with that one? Um, I'd need to think a little bit on that one. It's a great question. Gary's probably had more experience on that, though. Have you got something on that, Gary? So that's steam and water environment. Uh, yeah. Um, steam, I've had quite a few of these. The one thing you do need to be careful of is, is superheated steam, which should be quite a high temperature, right? It's still within the, the 250 degrees um, operating temperature. Uh, steam it itself, like your LG2 or your um, gear bronzes will be fine in steam or water. LG2 is uh, where your gun metals are commonly used on ships and, and, and things like that and, and in water environment. They will discolour and get a, a bit of a film on them or a bit of corrosion, but that corrosion and the aluminium bronze as well gets that film on it. That helps to protect the material as well. So generally, uh, water environment is, is, is okay and steam. Um, the only one that would be a, a maybe would be the manganese bronze because it's actually a brass and uh, brasses can be susceptible to um, stress corrosion cracking and also uh, 
desigification, but not the, the manganese uh, bronze. So in general, your bronzes stand up reasonably well to water and steam. But once again, it depends on if it's fully Im and continuously immersed in water. The thing you'd have to watch would be uh, they call galvanic corrosion, with between two um, dissimilar similar metals. Uh, that's a completely different topic, probably for another webinar in the future or something like that. But overall, water and steam, they should perform well. Great, thank you for that. Um, hopefully that one helped you out, Thomas. Um, now I've got one here from Jack. Uh, when would you recommend silicon bronzes like C87300? Uh, I'm not quite sure what 87300 is, but I can just leap over and grab a book. <laughs> Do you know what that one is, Derek? No, not off the top of my head. I'd have to go for a book too. I'll just quickly look that up. But yeah, I'm actually using the ASTM handbook, which is a very, it's really the Bible that um, we work to. It ha has all, not only the chemical composition, but all the other properties and, and in cases of uh, continuous casting, it's, it's, you have ASTM B505, which covers all the torrances and that for the rods and tubes and that sort of thing. So that was 873. So it's a copper silicon alloy, right, gotcha. That would have very good corrosion resistance properties um, with the silicon addition in it. I'll just find it in the standard and I'll tell you. Let's have a look at the composition. I'm not aware of anybody that makes it, but um, obviously if, if it's copper alloys, most copper alloys can be made at the Christchurch plant at A.W. Fraser, um, but if it's an unusual alloy, it's got to be a, uh, a reasonable volume to justify the, the making of it. Because with the continuous casting process and whatever you, uh, you need to make, you can't not make a reasonable amount. You can't just make 50 kilos or something like that. I think Derek or Cormax would probably tell you the, the minimum um, run quantities or whatever for, for a lot of these unusual alloys. Uh, 873, so 873 looks like it's a... Uh, a manganese silicon alloy. I don't have the data there for it, but I could find uh, the data from the ASTM standard. So that would have good corrosion resistance um, because it's only just copper. And then as far as strength goes, uh, it's 7.3. So it's listed as having 310 megapascals of tensile strength, 124 of yield strength, and 20% ion gas. So it's only a uh, a moderate strength alloy, it's not a high strength alloy. Um, I would suspect it's used for its corrosion resistance or or possibly its ductility. So some of these silicon bronze type alloys can be used, uh, can be bent. And they're also very popular with architectural stuff like doing um, statues and, and that sort of thing. Uh, 873, yeah. Great. Um, well, what we might do is just take one more question in that case. Um, so I've got one here from Chris. Uh, we might get you to give it a shot first, Derek. Uh, what material is better for heavily loaded worm wells operating at moderate speeds, say 100 RPM? Yeah, great question. Thanks, Chris. Um, so most certainly that job falls to the phosphor bronzes, um, which as Gary mentioned, they're also called gear bronzes. They withstand the pressure of use in a heavily loaded gear um, better than any other bronze. I think that's, that, that, that's it in a nutshell, isn't it, Gary? Yeah, although you can use, I, I do know of AB2 being used for gears, and 954, um, they are also used for gears. Um, but yeah, like I say, traditionally it was your gear bronze, your PB1, your PB2, but you can use aluminium bronzes, but you've got to... Um, be very careful about your lubrication and the, the spindle, of course, will need to be much harder or whatever you're running on it than, than with the, uh, the gear bronze. So, and there's also uh, other factors that come in, uh, things like the coefficient of friction and other things which you're getting into bearing design, which is more for uh, the engineers, um, like the core mats and that sort of thing. Um, but yeah, so um, you can use aluminium bronze, but Traditionally, you would use um, phosphor bronzes. Yeah, that's about it. Thanks, Chris. Great. Um, well, I'll pop back in here then. So we'll wrap up the Q&A at that. 
Um, what I'd like to do is say thank you very much, Gary and Derek, for your time today. Really appreciate the presentation and your uh, thoughtful questions and answers. Um, I just want to remind everyone that we actually do have another webinar coming up. Um, this one's going to be on machining techniques and it's scheduled for the 4th of August. So you should expect an invitation to that one very soon. Um, we have recorded today's session, so expect the recording in the next couple of days so you can re-watch it again at your leisure. Um, and once again, thank you for attending. Thank you for the awesome questions and have a great rest of your day, everyone.